science cares about you no matter whether you love science or hate science. Mm. As people come to understand the power of it, everyone's going to care. Hi Eric, thanks for coming down for the interview. We're going to start with just a very broad general question and it's what does good science look like and where, where have we gone wrong? Well, it's odd that you ask me of all people because I think I'm one of the only people who would give you the answer that part of the problem is that we have too much good science. And that, in fact, good science and great science are not exactly the same thing. Good science okay. is what we're most familiar with because we know how to train people in it. It has to do with uh, being extremely careful, um, not falling for uh, artifacts in your data, um, making sure that you have high statistical significance, being extremely modest in your claims and in your thought process. It's extremely important that there is a core, in fact, the majority of science is good science. Mm -hmm. What's really disturbing, and I think something that really hasn't been seized upon, is that great science is often very different. It's not just good science turned up to 11, which is my usual line. It's in fact a different process and it borders on the irresponsible. It has to do with crossing the adaptive valley to posit something that makes no sense, to say things that are in fact wrong for a period of time before they're right. And perhaps the only two really accomplished uh, scientists who've written on this topic with which I'm familiar might be Dirac who wrote about it in 1963 in Scientific American, an article that needs to be read by everyone is widely misinterpreted as saying that beauty is more important than agreement with experiment. And Jim Watson who uh, had rules for succeeding in science and in fact these are clearly not rules for good science because he was never a good scientist. He was merely a great one. Mm. So so maybe, maybe another example um, is someone like Feynman, mm. right? So the way the way he behaved, the way he toyed with ideas was, I imagine, not very popular at the time, not the, not the kind of thing that constituted good science, but he's sort of gone down in history as one of the century defining physicists, right? Yes, although you have to realize that if you really understand Feynman, he was in fact not understanding of his own work. He viewed uh, much of his work as being a dippy process for sweeping away infinities that had plagued mm. the equations of quantum electrodynamics or quantum field theory. And in fact, uh, it took Ken Wilson to really say why Feynman and Schwinger and Tomonaga's techniques mm. uh, in fact worked, that they weren't a, an infinity canceling trick, but rather they were a reflection of scale and something much deeper, which is the restriction of one's questions to the layer or strata at which those questions do not depend on certain inaccuracies or distortions. Every model has distortions. Some questions are dependent upon the distortions at that layer, others are not. Mm. If you're very careful, you stratify the questions and the layer of the model, and you can work with a flawed model without getting flawed answers. Right. And so Ken Wilson really elucidated that Feynman um, in fact, didn't follow his own theory far enough. One of the reasons he failed to predict the uh, Z-naught particle uh, was that neutral currents were needed for renormalization. He had introduced renormalization. He said that's not a good enough reason to predict a particle, mm. and he missed yeah. a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting. So the, I'm just thinking about what are the characteristics um, of, of the people who have been great scientists or have done great science? So, so Things like uh, creativity, I imagine, sure. bravery as well, um, self-confidence. So these are because they have to say and Deception. do things. Say again. Well, with Gregor Mendel, for example, we mm. think he fudged his Peapod data right. to be artificially perfect. So, uh, in fact, skullduggery, deception, all sorts of uh, very strange characteristics have crept yeah. into good science. Drug use, yeah. in the case of yeah. Kerry Mullis, uh, believing in dreams, in the case of Kukuli and benzene. So I think we have to understand that great science is an entirely different kettle of fish. We're very uncomfortable with it because mm. how do you teach people? It's like Werner Herzog, the great film director, um, made a point of saying you have to uh, lie, beg, borrow, and steal to make great art. And I think that, that this is really unexplored because we're uncomfortable transmitting the rules for great science and we've fallen into stagnation because of it. Yeah, so let's think then about the practical consequences of this observation. So there's something ever so slightly, well, there's a tension in the idea of trying to create an environment which breeds more great science, mm -hmm. right? Because part of the characterization is linked to this main body of 
good science right. such that one can strike out from it to be a great scientist. Um, so how can we foster an environment? Is it just that we need to be more accepting of those figures, of those moments when they come? Or is there something positive we can do to create the possibility? This is a great fear of mine about the UK. It's you who should be teaching us how to do this because you've been punching above your weight. What you do is you put people under incredible pressure to show their competency. Mm. But once they've actually revealed themselves to be part of a naturally self-selecting elite, you embrace elitism for all of its positives mm. rather than uh, decide that these people have to be subjected to all the horrors of normal life. Mm. And I think that the, uh, the Oxbridge system um, is in danger of succumbing to America's current passion for uh, equity and egalitarian outcome, when in fact, um, what you want to do is not self-select on bloodlines, but self-select mm. on ability and then allow the truly extraordinary, the eccentricities of their minds, because it's like great wood has a grain to it and a sculptor would never impose the figure without first consulting the wood as mm -hmm. to which way it wishes to be, to be moved and shaped. So this complacency that we, we're worried that perhaps the scientific community or perhaps the epistemic community at large is slipping into, Yeah. Um, so what exactly is, is the danger? That, is the danger that there will be missed opportunities for discoveries, for revolutions and paradigm shifts? Or, or is, there, is there a sort of it's far worse than ethical that. danger as well? I think it's a tremendous ethical danger, right. but I think people don't understand it. We've led people into the valley of death. Right. Uh, our previous 20th century adventures were so powerful that they're, we're probably not compatible with the leverage of our discoveries particularly from the years 1952 and 53, when we discovered fusion and yeah. the three-dimensional structure of yeah. DNA leading to the genetic code in 1963, 10 years later. That is so much power that as we've seen with COVID and as we've seen um, with the H-bombs that have never been used against humans, uh, we're probably not compatible with a single planetary surface. So at the moment, you actually need a Hail Mary Mm. And nobody wants to work on a Hail Mary because it makes us look non-respectable. Now, if somebody had said, um, you know, in the 1800s, we're going to have the power of the sun on the surface of the earth, they would have sounded like a lunatic. Mm. On the other hand, now we know that that's entirely doable. So at the moment, I worry that uh, even over my lifetime, we've learned how not to take our dreams seriously, how not to channel them into science, how not to bring rigor to our imagination. And so we're chasing people with true imagination out of the sciences because what we're saying is, is that that's not good science. And by the way, they're, they're, it's not incorrect. It's often not good science. Right. And it's very important not to fetishize good science because that's humanity's death now. Right. So. So there's, there's, a, there's also an interesting communications question here, right? So um, we want to be fostering, uh, fostering the kind of opportunities for great science, which often, as you mentioned, uh, involve ever, ever so slightly irresponsible outlooks. Um, but there is also a need to be uh, communicating with some areas of society who don't even understand, you know, what good science is. Um, and... There seems to be both a, both a kind of need at one level to be creating great science and another to be communicating what the point of having good science was. How do you think we can give those messages simultaneously? You've had COVID. I have, yeah. Yeah, so have I. Yeah. Uh, I knew that we both had it and probably this comes out of science. Now, whether or not you care about furin cleavage sites and whether mm. you care about amino acids and four of them strung together in the spike mm -hmm. protein making uh, coronavirus virus incredibly... Uh, virulent, uh, your lungs cared about it, your ACE receptors cared about it, whatnot. Right. So my, my feeling about this is science cares about you no matter whether you love science or hate science. Mm. As people come to understand the power of it, everyone's going to care. Now the problem is when we disguise the interest in science and say, well, how, where did this virus come from? Did it come from a pangolin? Did it come mm, from a civic mm. cat? Instead say any questioning of this virus, in fact, is tantamount to racism. Well, now what you've done is you've killed the scientific impulse in all sorts of children. You've told them that scientists are not powerful enough to rule their own roost. Mm. In fact, 
we are playing games, engaging in skullduggery. So in, in some sense, the, the sort of tolerance for bad behavior was spent on somebody like Anthony Fauci when it should have been spent on somebody like a Francis Crick. Mm. Or for in, fa in fact, the person who stopped thalidomide from being a problem inside of the U.S. was Frances Kelsey, educated at the University of Chicago, mm. to be highly disagreeable. And she simply stood in the way and said, I don't think you've proven to me that your drug is safe. Mm. Uh, would such a person be tolerated if they said to Pfizer, to Moderna, uh, I don't think that these platforms are actually sufficiently tested and you're asking to undergo a huge experiment when the virus appears to be targeting the elderly and obese? Uh, in fact, the problem is, is that we've diminished scientists so far below administrators mm. that we have to seek their permission. And I think what it's time for is a scientific revolution in which we tell the administrators to get the hell out of our labs. Right, right. So, so am, I, am I to hear that the, um, because I take it that the usual line is that COVID, though obviously wreaking havoc, was a great opportunity for boosting people's interest in science and boosting some progress on certain specific areas. Sure. Do you realize that with 12 nucleotides, you can shut down planet Earth and that you have a child who might have access to PCR and, and maybe CRISPR-Cas9? Of course, you can interest anybody in science, but the right. problem is this idea, science is interesting. Take an interest in science. It's right. a terrible right. idea. Science is extremely frustrating, but it's got very high leverage. Yeah. We should actually be truthful about science, and we're not being truthful. We're trying to make science into something that is mildly interesting. Yeah, yeah. And you're, you're signing up people for careers that are incredibly frustrating, uh, in decreasing in prestige, uh, and in mm. fact, one of the few things you can do with science is shut down a planet with fair, fair ease. So do you think that um, one way to get across this lesson about the power of the leverage of science, which has been lost in the communication, is doing the history of science? Sure, but that might include, for example, the kid who scavenged uh, smoke detectors for their uh, radioactive element, americium, right. and built a working reactor, uh, I think in Brooklyn. Right. Right? So right. in other words, if you're going, it, it, it's like trying to sell skateboarding. Skateboarding is a, an activity for ne'er-do-wells that sometimes, uh, you know, results in greatness. Yeah. Um, trying to tell people don't take drugs without mentioning that drugs are fun. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we're constantly lying to people, uh, there's no opportunity to actually reacquaint ourselves with the wonder of science. And I think that part of the problem is this idea of pro-social, good-for-you science mm. is too narrowly constructed. You can get any child allowed to play with a chemistry kit where you can have potentially dangerous explosions or you mm. can turn something into a fountain of goo. You know, <laughs> Those things sell themselves. The yeah. real problem is trying to interest people in... Uh, dull as church science that is within keeping with all of the restrictions that we're going to place on our brightest minds. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So maybe let's turn to the biographical now, right? Now we're talking about how to get people interested in science. Yeah. What was your first interest in science? How did you begin? Sure, it might have come from my grandfather, who was probably acknowledged to be the smartest person in our extended family, but who could not finish university. Mm. Probably had pretty severe learning issues uh, in a modern context. And he simply looked at the world through an extremely humanistic and very scientific lens. And so just coming to understand that everything could be open, the world was open source and user serviceable. You could open any panel and try to understand what made a flower tick or mm. uh, what, what you were seeing during a meteor shower. So I think that was incredibly empowering. And then I think that um, I made a radical decision not to listen to my learning differences in school. Mm. And so while school was telling me that I was not very smart, uh, I just decided that school was the problem and I was not. And so I followed that path and that battle probably formed me. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most interesting things I've learned today is that you're not the first person to say that to me in these interviews. That's been a running theme, actually. Well, we're actually sort of, an the, the tiny number of survivors mm. of the school wars, right. because schools <laughs> try to stamp out anyone with a learning difference, and I yeah, believe yeah. that these things aren't disabilities, but they're superpowers with negative externalities. Yeah, and yeah. what they do is they tease out teaching disabilities on the part of the teaching profession. Yeah, the teaching yeah. profession doesn't want to have teaching disabilities, so they turn around and create learning disabilities, which are actually non-existent for the most part. Right, right. So one thing that I think a, a theme that has been running through the interview is this idea of um, 
you know, stepping back and allowing extraordinary people, giving them the resource they need and allowing them to essentially express themselves to find this kind of great scientific moments. Um, and so it, it sort of leads us to this question about, well, what, what in the lives of these people is sort of contributing to that? And one, one thing I was thinking was, well, you know, what are, what are the relationship that these people have to faith? Right. So, I mean, maybe could we could we talk about the relationship um, in in your work between how you see what you do and um, whether Judaism has played a role in that or driven that in any particular way? Right. So I'm a, I'm I'm an atheist who prays. Right. And uh, you have to recognize that when you have an extraordinary contribution of a small group of people like the Parsis in India, mm -hmm. that there's something in the cultural practices that leads to an outsized outcome. Right. And so it would, it would be entirely irrational if Jews were to throw over the irrationality of their own tradition if that was in fact a demonstrable, scientifically re reproducible advantage. So my belief about this is that there's something in the ethics, the legal discipline from Talmudic thinking mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that actually grooves the mind quite well, in particular for physics. Um, I worry that we've thrown over lots of things that we now know not to be true but we didn't understand that these were load-bearing right. um, behaviors right. and that effectively we, we knocked out the rotting pillars before replacing them with something else. Yeah, so I mean, when you, when you were thinking about this, did you look at a range of practices and traditions? Um, because you say you're an atheist that prays, right? So you thought, you thought about how these practices are actually incredibly important for developing the sure. mind and giving yourself the space to come up with fantastic ideas and so forth. Um, you know, did you did you look at a number of different practices with which to engage as an atheist, or was it simply obvious that Judaism was going to be? I think that I had an intuition that there was a Chomskyan pre-grammar of religion and metaphysics, right? And that you have a receptor that has to be bound; it cannot remain unbound. So the great fallacy of atheism is is that it is safe and adaptive to mm. try to leave the receptor unbound because. Yeah. The issue is that there is some metaphysics that is going to bind to that receptor whether or not the truth value of that metaphysics can be decided. Yeah. Uh, given that, I found that I happened to be in possession of one of the more benign things that could bind that receptor. So right. just the way it's very, it's very unlikely that you speak no language at all, mm. right? right? And mm. uh, you have to probably address that some way and recognize that that human need for metaphysics should cloud your reason as little as possible and as much as is necessary. Right, brilliant. Well, I think we should wrap it up there. Thank you very much. Thank you, really enjoyed it. <laughs>